I thank you all for joining us. We're delighted to have you here today. We appreciate your taking uh, the time to uh, sit with us and to talk about something quite interesting, uh, which is this unique book that Glenn Ford has produced, uh, Talking to North Korea. And uh, it really grabs one, I think, in an interesting and new way. It sits in an interesting place in the uh, canon of new literature on Korea, a devolving interest in North Korea. Uh, it is very well situated, I think, given our current political dynamics and progress and symmetry and inter-Korean relations over the course of the last year. And uh, you will see next to it, and it might surprise me, why do we have a a man city football? Uh, one is that uh, Glenn Ford is also the uh, uh, supreme uh, fan, at least resident in New York today, uh, of, uh, of Man City, uh, but also because he begins his tale uh, by his introduction to North Korea through football in 1966. And I'll, I'll let him uh, lead with that. I did want to point out by way also on the book that uh, uh, Bill Urey at the Harvard uh, Project on Negotiation Studies uh, is one of the people who said kind words you'll see on the cover. And that uh, in that sense, this puts us in this book in an in interesting place. There are not a lot of case studies on how one talks uh, to or with North Korea. And certainly, Harvard Pons has seen the benefit of that. Uh, there are also nice endorsements from Andre Lankoff, uh, 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 Jeff Feltman, uh, and uh, Moon Chung In. And uh, all these, these individuals have been either on the stage or in our executive boardroom in the course of the last year. So I think there's great common cause and enthusiasm for this book, Lynn. So thank you for, for this labor. And tell us about 1966 and how you met the North Korean... Uh, well, I, I mean, do I, I actually did meet the yeah. North Koreans in 1966, but I, I was a, a young football fan, and uh, many people were taken with the fact that in 66, for the first time ever, uh, the North Korean football team qualified for the World Cup, mm. and uh, they came and played in the United Kingdom, and rather famously, uh, I, though I feel sorry for any Italians in the audience, they beat Italy 1-0, um, uh, which was a, a stunning result. Uh, and, and because they, I think, drawn with Chile as well, they went through to the quarterfinals. In those days, you did not get to the quarterfinals after two matches. But in these days, you don't get to the quarterfinals after two matches. And they then played Portugal in a match that I watched on TV. And the North Koreans, after about 30 minutes, were 3-0 up. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Portugal had Eusebio, a rather famous football player, and he scored four goals in reply, and, uh, and somebody else got another one as well. So they ended up rather famously losing 5-3. And that, that, that sparked my interest. Um, I then was, uh, uh, I got elected to the European Parliament about uh, nearly 20 years later. And uh, I'd actually been a visiting professor at Todai just before I got elected uh, to Tokyo University. Uh, but, and so I tended to specialize in, in, in uh, East Asia in terms of the Foreign Affairs Committee and, and the Trade Committee. So... Uh, I met with the North Koreans several times, but then in the late, late 90s, uh, of 97, in fact, they came to see me. They said, we desperately need food aid. Uh, we're not allowed to talk to people in the European Commission. They won't take our phone calls. Uh, we have no diplomatic relations with the European Union. Uh, uh, can you do something to help us? And I basically said that, uh, well, I need to see what the situation is on the ground. And I went on an unofficial delegation with two colleagues, uh, uh, two, two, uh, two North Korea to the DPRK, and clearly saw how grim the situation was in the, in the, in the children's centers, in the orphanages. We toured around the country, went up to Wichon, uh, up in the, in, the, in the north center of the country, and it, uh, it was grim. Uh, and I mean, I'm not a, well, I am a scientist, I'm not, but I'm not a medical scientist. And so uh, on that basis, we came back uh, uh, and, I, and I said to them in Pyongyang, would you like an official delegation? And uh, well, they said, yes. I said, you don't care how I get it, do you? And they said, no. So I went back with my colleagues. We tabled a resolution in the European Depart Parliament saying how, how terrible the situation was and demanding access to, uh, to, uh, to the DPRK. Uh, much to the surprise of everyone who voted for the resolution, uh, 
The reply from Pyongyang was fine, send a delegation. <laughs> and so, uh, and so uh, because I'd been there, I was then on the delegation. And we had the former Belgian prime minister, myself, and a, uh, and a, a, a former Dutch agricultural minister went there on a, this first official delegation. And I won't go through it all. I've now been there. I've lost count, but it's 50 times. Uh, and so I, I now know a lot more about North Korea than I did back then. Mm. In, interesting. And in, in, in this book, if you could kind of guide us through uh, its inception, you wrote it in a, a, a fairly fast manner. It, it came yeah. out in, within. I mean, let me say, yeah. I did have a previous book on on, on North Korea published about uh, ten years ago. This is very much not a second edition. Right. It's been there are. I mean, the structure has got the same similarities, but I mean, it's uh, my own views have become much more sophisticated. I think on the basis of my visits and and my reading and my and my conversations. So uh, there are some things I say in the first book I'm slightly embarrassed by, uh, in that uh, I've got a much more nuanced idea. I mean, I've been lucky. I mean, it's accident rather than design, but. Uh, when I first went to North Korea, the people who were my hosts were the party, uh, partly because I was a, a, a political representative. And I've maintained that essentially all the way through. Uh, with a, uh, Occasionally, there's been the odd delegation that's been dealt with by the Supreme People's Assembly or the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or whatever. But my relationship is with the party. And of course, in, in North Korea, in my view, and a lot of other people's view, it's the party that make the decisions so you've got an access there and uh, at the moment we have a dialogue with the head of the international department of the party that i i was asked if i'd set up about six seven years ago and so myself and jonathan powell who was tony blair's head of office and runs an organization called intermediate on peacekeeping he was very much involved in the irish peacekeeping process along with a few other uh, former senior politicians from france from sweden from germany have had this uh, ongoing dialogue and so what's it about uh, it seems to me that north korea it, firstly i don't think i need to tell this audience but they're actually perfectly rational uh, the, 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 I mean, you may not like the decisions that are being made, but they're made rationally. Uh, Kim Jong-un uh, faces two existential threats. Uh, they are absolutely and possibly understandably paranoid about uh, what happened in Iraq, what happened in Libya, what happened in, in Syria. Back 15 years ago around uh, North Korea, uh, Kim Jong-un's father was being told, why don't you follow the Libyan example? Uh, I mean, there they've given up their nuclear pretensions. They've been welcomed into the world. Uh, you could do the same thing. Well, it didn't help that the month before Kim Jong-un took power, uh, he could watch Colonel Gaddafi being rather brutally murdered on live TV. So the nuclear, the nuclear deterrent, it, uh, their argument would be the problem is not having weapons of mass destruction. It's not having weapons of mass destruction. Those that have given them up have been the, the the ones that have been overthrown so we need we need a nuclear deterrent it's also a reflection in my view of weakness rather than strength if you look at the the situation on the ground i mean south korea i mean north korea spends you know, a quarter of its gdp on on, on its military maybe more maybe up to 30 percent but it's 30 percent and not very much and, and south korea spends uh, five times more on its military than North Korea does. If you add in uh, Japan and the United States, they're outspent by a factor of 50. They've not lost the arms race. They've been outlapped several times. Uh, the clashes, they tend, they, they, tend to, they tend to lose. I mean, if you, if you put North Korea on the world stage, I mean, its military spending is just below that of Australia, who nobody often refers to as one of the world's big military powers. So you've got that, that threat. And the second threat is if you want the internal threat and the importance of keeping the people who matter. And those, you can, you can say that's the people living in Pyongyang. Uh, keeping the people who matter happy, and that means you need to raise living standards. Uh, you, you, you need to improve uh, pe people's lives. 
And one can argue this has happened. Both Pyongyang is better off than it ever has been, or at least was until until 12 months ago. Even in the rural areas, the the, the reforms of 2002, uh, 2003 period, and the more recent reforms of family work units have led to a, a marginal improvement in living standards in the countryside. The one area that's still grim is what I call the Rust Belt. If you go up sort of Ham Hung, Hung Nam, Chong Jin, Kim Chek, those areas, you still find, I mean, real, real problems with industry. And secondly, because of the, the, central, the central mountain chain, you've actually got very narrow coastal plains, very little local agricultural production, and, and, and often very poor roads. And so people at the end of the, uh, end of the delivery service are not getting necessarily the, the amount of food they need. People are hungry but not starving. So, so those are the threats. The problem we've got is that the, the first uh, dealing with the first problem of external security with a nuclear deterrent means you can't deal with the first problem because you get the sanctions, and, 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 and that's the uh, that's the difficulty you actually face. And secondly, you also have a problem that North Korea is not a developing country. I mean, some people think of it that way. But it's an industrial industrial society to par, in partial collapse, uh, and so you don't have a pool of agricultural labour you can bring into the discipline of the of the factories and, and grow the economy. You need to you need to take people out of the military, and again, the nuclear deterrent allows you to decamp people out of the military into the civilian sector. Where Kim Jong Un has possibly a rather old-fashioned view of how economies grow, but maybe he's just right. I mean, in the sense that the North Korea is probably one of the last areas where you've got skilled in cheap labour which can be employed in Quezon, Rasong, or whatever, as opposed to, if you want, the, the unskilled variety, which is available all over the world. So you, th those are the threats, and that's what I'm trying to deal, deal with in a way. Though there is, uh, there's a fair amount, some chapters on, on, on the history from probably the, well, certainly from 45 onwards. Sure. It, one of the things you do, and I, and I also think of Hazel Smith and her book on, on North Korea military and modernization, is uh, early on try to dispel myths uh, or, or these concepts that we may have in the West uh, that don't really quite sync up. And mm. you've alluded to some of them. But I wondered if you wanted to say more about that. And also, you acknowledge the repress repressive aspects of the regime, but but really come around to point out that there, there are forces that want to end that isolationism. And that's what we need to recognize. Yeah, I mean... I, I I mean, I'm certainly uh, that there are enormous human rights problems in North Korea that that need to be that need to be dealt with, and I don't think anyone can can deny that. Uh, I do have a view that a rising tide floats all ships, uh, and I think all the evidence is around the world that as as, as economies improve, uh, standards of living and other aspects of human rights improve as well. Uh, and, and certainly, when we're there, we always raise the human rights issue with with, with the North Koreans, and there, there are things that can be done. I mean, the European Union was the only uh, organisation actually had a human rights dialogue with North Korea for a period of time after 2001, and we're we're keen to restart that that, that human rights dialogue. But you talked about some of the myths. I mean, uh, frankly, North Korea is not a uh, is not a communist country. Uh, I mean, it's a it's a religious cult with communist characteristics, as I as I think I I I, I put it in the book. I mean, the the last pictures of uh, of Marx and Lenin used to be on the Ministry of Foreign Trade in Kim Il Sung Square. They came down about five years ago, uh, and I jokingly asked, uh, "What happened to them? Oh, they're being refurbished." Well, I was back. I, I was back in September, driving through Kim Il Sung Square, and I, I, I'm the North Korea's ideal. I've some of them I've de been dealing with for more than twenty years, so I, I have a relationship. Uh, I said, "Well, what, when are Marx and Lenin coming back? Oh, they're not finished yet, being uh, re uh, refurbished." I said, "You built a hundred thousand flats last year, and it's taken you five years to do two paintings." Uh, so I mean that's one of the issues. Another issue is on uh, reunification. I mean, there's a view that that's a dr that's a driving demand of North Korea. It, it, it isn't. Uh, they're realistic. Uh, you know, and early reunification can only be assimilation. 
The South Korean economy is 40, 50 times bigger than the North Korean economy. What we want, uh, we're, we would like to reunify, but the way through it is a, it's a long road. Get off our backs. I mean, that's their argument. We have been suppressed by you know, sanctions from, uh, from the rest of the world and from, particularly from the United States. If only the United States could get off our backs. We're as bright as we're intelligent, we're as hardworking as the other Asian tigers. We can grow our economy at 10, 15% a year for 25 years. Then we can talk. Then you can have a real conversation about reunification. So, yes, they're interested in reunification, but it's two generations' time, not now. You, you uh, I think, say a lot that, that add great nuance to the way that we look at the current situation, both in terms of the great progress in inter-Korean mm -hmm. reconciliation. And I know a number of your, your points will fall well uh, with the administration in Seoul, uh, who I think share some of that same uh, appreciation for, for the nuance and positivity. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm wondering how you look at this recent progress, uh, which has been historic and some of the markers of just this last month with the destruction of guard posts along the DMZ, et cetera, and north-south troops taking strolls, sharing cigarettes, and real efforts at confidence building that don't necessarily always make big news, at least outside the Korean Peninsula. Um, you know, how you see that on a trajectory, this, this move away from... Uh, the hostilities and the high tensions of, of just a year, year and a half ago, uh, and where we're going with the summary process. I mean, there's a lot. There's of, a lot there. There's, a, there's yeah. a lot of different questions in there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's amazing how quickly we've moved. I mean, I, I was in North Korea in December uh, last the year before last, so December 2017, which was after the uh, the second ICBM launch. And it was just after, it was immediately after the ICBM launch, Kim Jong-un said, you know, you know, we finished our program. But it really wasn't picked up. It was only when he, uh, with the New Year address, that became a message. And then tensions were very, very high. Uh, very, I mean, you know, we there was a real prospect of slipping accidentally into war this was the this is when we were talking about the bloody nose and uh, and and preemptive strikes disappearing a north korean submarine uh, taking a missile out after launch or a missile all of this uh, was was there and it, it it really was quite a dangerous period and we've got away from that uh, and I'm delighted, and and we've got away from that by what the North Koreans have a two twin uh, twin track strategy, uh, a bilateral negotiation with South Korea and a bilateral negotiation with the United States, and then certainly until very recently the idea was keeping those as separate as possible. You wanted two separate negotiations, one on North South relations and one on if you want denuclearization with the United States. Uh, more recently, that's begin, begun to shift a little, uh, the, and the New Year's address is now talking about, in terms of, if you want, security guarantees, talking about involving uh, a multilateral process. I think that's been partly shaped by what I call uh, around the JPCOA, the, the Iran deal because obviously the North Koreans are very disappointed that the United States has, uh, has gone back on the, on the Iran deal. But what they found was rather different was it had a robustness and a resilience that when, George Bo when, when, the, when President Bush abrogated the agreed framework, it was over. The JPCOA has got this resilience and that, that, that's there. So I think they're now increasingly looking at trying to, if you want, negotiate a deal that ends up being guaranteed at least by somebody like the UN Security Council, certainly yeah, the Chinese, probably the Russians, the, the South Koreans and the rest. So you, you, you actually have some, some protection uh, for it. They're also looking for, uh, alongside that, some, some serious money. Uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, I, th I think like with the agreed, fra the agreed framework, uh, you know, the, uh, the US, South Korea, Japan and the European Union are going to build two light water reactors, which are going to cost $4.5 billion. They're certainly looking for that kind. I mean, it may not be nuclear reactors. It may be infrastructure. It may be railways, pipelines. Uh, the, big, the big choke choke point is actually uh, energy. So it may, it, I mean, they... 
in the New Year's address, what did Kim Jong-un talk about? He talked about wind power, tidal power, and atomic power, uh, alongside a massive increase in coal production, which is not very good news for the climate change lobby. Hmm. I, I'd like to, before turning to the audience, just sort of talk my last question on, on the writing process. I, I really enjoyed this book. Uh, uh, more so than many. I mean, many of the people I talk with here on the stage are, are people like myself, scholars who are trying to write. And we may uh, do a good assemblage of information or try to make points. Uh, but you are a crisp uh, and and lyrical writer. And, and uh, it's an easy book to move through on what many people might think is a, a rather intimidating or at least certainly complex reality. Uh, and you do that very gracefully. And I think, uh, as you mentioned several books toward the beginning, uh, you invoke our, our friend James Church, who, who has done the Inspector O series. I, I would say I enjoyed this alongside that as, as you know, really very, very good writer. I don't know if you're a, a great analyst who writes well or, or a great writer who happens to be a good uh, well, analyst, I mean, but, but it really is, is uh, uh, wonderful that way. And I highly recommend it to the audience. Our friends from Pluto Press are here with copies for sale uh, at $15 uh, by card. Uh, or cash, but how do you how do you see that process, and and uh, where do you see it? I mentioned uh, you know Yuri's recommendation, the author of Getting to Yes. Uh, you know where do you sort of see it there alongside how we should look at, at case studies of negotiation, and and where does it fit in the big? Well, picture? I mean, firstly, I'm I'm glad you and other people like it. Uh, it's been a hard road. Uh, I have been a, a writer for a long time in the sense I, uh, throughout my, I've spent 25 years in the European Parliament. In Britain, you get less for murder. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and throughout that Must time, I was, you know, I, I was writing political articles mm. and the rest. So I, I, I've done my 10,000 hours probably of, mm. of writing, which is supposed to get you to, to at least some kind of level. Mm. Uh, I also enjoyed writing it because I, I felt there was a need to, to write something that was not absolutely not sort of pro-North Korean, but actually saw them in a different way from the, the – I mean, most American writing is on North Korea. Uh, not all. There are, there, are a lot, there are a number of exceptions. It is it, very black and white. And I think, I think North Korea is rather more nuanced mm -hmm. than, than that. And I, and I do suffer from the fact that, as I said, I've known some of the people I deal with in North Korea for 20 years. So they've got married, they've had children, and they're trying to get them into the Kim Il-sung University. So I, I've got that kind of uh, – that that kind of relationship, which I think means that you get a level, uh, you get a level of knowledge that is not easy, it's not easy to get, uh, and I think it's important to try and, and put that across. I guess the the reason for for what I'm doing is, I'm a politician. I mean, I was a member, I still am a member of the British Labour Party. Uh, we can do Brexit after this if you want. Um, <laughs> Um, and so uh, uh, on the international committee of the the party and the rest. So I have a I have a political agenda. Uh, and I'm 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 not ashamed of that in any way whatsoever. Uh, I was our foreign affairs spokesman in the European Parliament for a while, and I resigned over the uh, over the Iraq War. Uh, I actually understood what was happening with Afghanistan. That seemed to be a, a logical response. We, uh, but I think that change your regime beats regime change any day. Uh, what I'm doing is to do what I can to try and get that process underway. I hold no brief for the leadership of uh, uh, of North Korea, but I'm well aware the people who are suffering are going to be those ordinary, the millions of ordinary people out there if there is any attempt to, to do in North Korea what actually happened in Iraq, Libya, or Syria. Hmm. I, I like how you invoke Fifty Shades of Grey in here, but I, I suspect that, <laughs> that title was used for something yeah, yeah, else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's good. And, and it is. And, and for those of you who don't know, that Glenn's contact in through the labor side is probably uh, the senior most of, of, of really any international visitor to North Korea. So it's impressive. And and your your insights, your experience, and you've mentioned between the first and and this book, uh, you know, you've up from 20 to, to 50 trips, and, and it, it brings great, I think, sophistication and, and a really wonderful read to us. I know we'll be using it at Columbia in the fall for our graduate political science yeah, yeah. course. So I, I, I do have to say that uh, the, the downside for the North Koreans in London is they, they get taken by me to, to football matches. Uh, 
<laughs> it's when Manchester City are playing away in London. Oh, and, there uh, you go. I do have the view that that's why uh, Mr. Mr. Tay defected. Uh, I took him to a football match, which was terrible. A torrential rain, and it was a nil-nil draw, and he, he promptly defected. <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you for a fascinating hour. Uh, we've really appreciated it, and uh, we'll thank you properly in a moment. But before, uh, I would like to invite you to please uh, uh, evaluate the program uh, on the sheets you have. Uh, please join us as members, and we have membership uh, material at the back of the room. If you're not a member already, we'd love to have you sign up, and we do have representatives uh, at the back. And uh, I look forward to seeing you at our future programs. Our new calendar is out. I did also want to acknowledge and thank uh, two people in particular here. Fred Carrier in the back of the room, who was vice president of the Korea Society for 18 years. It's wonderful to see him back here. Whitey Kim of our board, uh, who has uh, lent, uh, lent us all his wisdom for many years. So thank you both. And uh, to all our friends and dignitaries in the room, thank you. And to Glenn Ford, thank you. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, Glenn joined us this morning for an extensive briefing. Uh, for the United Nations, and uh, we appreciate this hour uh, that you've spent with us. Uh, the Manchester Bowl is for you to take to your granddaughter in uh, Washington, <laughs> D.C., and remember that uh, Man City Blue is also Korea Society Blue, or vice versa, so I hope that works for Which you. Which came first? And so uh, we'll have books for sale in the back at $15, and uh, a chance for Glenn to sign that for you, and uh, we hope that, uh, that you enjoy that and you enjoy the read. It's a wonderful one, and thanks to our friends from Pluto. Thank you all. <laughs>